I want to share with you today a message that came out of a trip that Helen and I did three years ago. My wife's grandfather was one of the original Anzacs. He was landed on Anzac Cove at the age of about 19 in one of the first waves of soldiers that were dropped on the beach in Turkey. The centenary, the 100-year celebration or remembrance of that extraordinary failed military adventure was in 2015. And because Helen had a grandfather who was on the beach you know, during that uh, campaign, she was, we were both in the, the lottery to see if we could get tickets to be at that uh, great dawn celebration or dawn remembrance service uh, in Turkey. And we didn't get any tickets, so we just forgot all about it. But just a few weeks before the centenary, a cruise company, uh, an email room, uh, uh, arrived in my inbox from a cruise company who couldn't fill their ship. They were cruising out of Rome to Turkey for the Anzac ceremony and invited uh, people to, to apply. And we decided, we just happened to have two weeks where we, where we could do it. So we took the cruise. Uh, we cruised from Rome to Turkey for two days and on that trip, they had an expert on the ship who was giving lectures about the whole of the background to the Anzac story. And I had never heard the whole thing explained as carefully as it was on the way. And as a result, I was kind of really interested um, to, to go visit and to go see all this stuff. The interesting thing was at the, exactly at that time, I was doing my devotions in the Book of Ruth. Well, I had lots of questions about uh, the whole Anzac experience, the big story of the Anzac experience. Why were so many Australians, young Australians, so quick to run off to war in a foreign country? Why would you do that in Australia, get on a ship and head off to the other side of the world to fight in a foreign war? And the answer was because the story was so compelling. It was the just uh, a few years after the Federation of Australia. And here the mother country, the bastion of freedom and truth and liberty for the Western world was under attack. And the young lions of New Zealand and Australia and Canada need to come to the mother's rescue and fight for the liberty of the entire world. Very big story, glorious story. Uh, Liberty and freedom versus the ugliness of oppression. Who could resist the call to play their part? The big story is glorious. Big themes, liberty, oppression, courage, commitment, camaraderie, being part of a world-changing encounter. The big story is also uh, one of those things that draws a big brass band. Big parades down the street. Down the street we go. Marching because the big story is such a glorious story. Big parades. And then the big story calls for big commitments. And as a result... I need to join the crowd and I need to answer the call. What a worthy sacrifice. Who could say no when there is a cry for bravery? And not only that, the average Australian really believed it was going to be just a big overseas adventure. We'll get on a ship, we'll be away for a few months, we'll see the world and we'll all be home by Christmas. Didn't quite turn out that way. And as a result, when I finally arrived at Anzac Cove, I understood something of what brought young Australians to be jumping off boats with rifles in that little space on the face of the world. It's when you get to Anzac Cove that you bump into the contrast of the small story. You see, within the big story, there's a lot of small stories. Very poignant very confronting. And all too often those small stories are not glorious. There's just loss and suffering and struggle 
and often a feeling of profound futility. Many of these little graves, people never even reached the beach. Sacrificed an entire life for what? Well, for not very much at all. And standing in front of those graves, you cannot avoid but feel the tension between the big story on one side and all of its glorious trumpets and marching bands and the tragedy and the sadness of the small story, the poignancy, the futility of the small story and often reconciling those two stories for some people is very hard to do. Not everybody can do it. It's one of the reasons why leaders in war are often thought to be heartless. Because you see, if we allowed the small story to grip us, we could never make the decision to save a nation. It takes a special kind of a character. Uh, Colonel Hal Oxley was an example of one of those characters who was able to not only understand the poignancy of the small story, but had the courage to stand up and exercise leadership during the big story. And often, you know, even leaders in churches can sometimes uh, be thought, to, well, they, 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 don't, they don't have a heart like the rest of us. Oh, no. No, it's just that leaders have a big mission. Uh, leaders of churches sometimes have a big mission that requires us to think bigger than just an individual person's opinion. We, if you let everybody's personal opinion and everybody's personal feelings be the dominant factor, no big decisions could ever be made. And sometimes it requires uh, a, a particular kind of character to be able to lead, especially during a war. And Christianity is a war. We're in a war for souls. And the outcome is extraordinary. But the fact is, these small stories are very painful. There's just one small story. I stood in front of this tombstone and I read this small story. Trooper W.J. Gribble, 9th Australian Light Horse, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. I wonder who he was. Was he married or single? Was there a woman who wept her way through the rest of her life, grieving the loss of a husband who never returned? Was it a mother who grieved for the loss of W.J. Gribble and never saw her son return? But there he lies on a foreign shore, just a few metres above the beach at Anzac Cove. The tension between the big story on one hand and the small story goes right to the heart of the book of Ruth. And it was interesting that I was studying the book while I was on the ship. It was my devotional material for that week, those two weeks that I was away. And it drew my attention to the poignancy and the struggle of two mothers, one called Naomi and the other called Ruth, because these were two mothers who found themselves as uh, caught up in the, in the uh, very big story of the salvation of the entire world, and yet they were very small little women. Well, no one's really small, but, but often that's exactly how we feel. You see, there are big names in the big story. We've all heard the name of Adam. We've all heard the name of Abraham. We've all heard the name of Moses. You've all heard the name Jesus. You've all heard the name the Apostle Paul. These are the big names in the big story because the big story runs from Genesis in the garden where God Himself says to that first man and that first woman, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will crush the serpent's head and he will bruise your heel. In the big story, a big name like Abraham. To him, God says, by you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Doesn't get any bigger than that. And it stretches all the way to the book of Revelation, where the Bible says, and the kingdoms of our God shall become the kingdoms of His Lord and of His Christ. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. Stories don't get any bigger than this. It is the biggest story you will ever hear. And here are two small women caught up in a very big story. 
And the question is, how come their story ever got in the Bible? Why does this small story even enter into the Bible? And there's a simple answer, and that is it was written by the prophet Samuel because he saw the importance of showing the links in the chain so that the prophecies of the Old Testament where God spoke first of all to Abraham, then to Isaac and then to Jacob, through Jacob to Joseph through, and the 12 brothers into the tribe um, of praise. The, the great tribe where, uh, of Judah where one day King David would be born. It was important to show that King David was born of the tribe of Judah. And this little book is simply a link in the chain to show you where King David fits in the big story of the salvation of the world. And so here we come to the town or the city of David, to the little town of Bethlehem. And hundreds of a year before he was born, uh, a number of generations before he was born, here is a little family living in Bethlehem. And the question is, how did a little girl from Moab, a little foreigner from Moab, enter into the big story of the salvation of the entire world. That's why the book was written. But in the middle of this book is a very poignant insight of how it can feel when your story, your small story, intersects with his big story and the struggles that go on in the human heart when it seems like your story is insignificant, when it seems like your role in the world and in life is so small as to be discounted, this book was written for you. It's a very, important, a very poignant insight that it's not always easy to see that your small story is part of something great. And yet to every mother in this room, I want to say to you today, if there are moments where you feel like your role is such a small part, an insignificant part, you need to know you are a link in, in the greatest story that will be ever told and you need to realise the importance of the role that you play. These little lives play a role in the greatest story ever told, but they never saw it at the time and they never felt like it was part of a big story. The reason is, of course, you can't see the future. If only you could see the future. If only my mother could have seen the future and seen me standing here today. See, my mother didn't feel as if she was part of a great story when at the age of nine, the manager of Coles in Baldwin phoned her to say that I had been stealing things from their store and I needed some discipline. My mother didn't feel she was part of something great when I shot Russell Simpson in the backside with my air gun and the police came around and required her and I to attend the police station at Box Hill to explain why I was shooting the neighbours who were stealing things from my bicycle. <laughs> See, my mother didn't really feel that she was part of something great when the detective from QCID uh, knocked on our front door and arrested me for larceny of petrol from a police car because I had siphoned petrol out of a policeman's car. I was prosecuted. I remember my pastor standing for me in the courtroom, explaining to the magistrate what fine character uh, I was. <laughs> Not always easy to explain that when you have a hose and a can in the boot of your car and you are stealing other people's petrol. It's difficult for your minister to explain how that adds up to a fine and upstanding character. My mother could not see the future. Um, neither could these women, neither could Naomi and Ruth. They couldn't see the future, but they could see the past. They knew that Israel had a big story. Oh, they knew that God had chosen Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They knew that Joseph had been sold into slavery and because of that, their entire nation had spent 400 years in Egypt, eventually 
as slaves. They knew another big name by, by, the, by the person by the name of Moses had been called by God to lead them out. And he had led them out from under the nose of the biggest name in the world, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, the largest and most powerful nation in the earth at that time. They knew that through Joshua, there's another big name, he had led the nation into the promised land and that the judges had been ruling their land through the past troubled years. They knew all of that. But now in the midst of their little lives, Bethlehem is in trouble. Bethlehem. The name means the house of bread. Problem is there was no bread in the house of bread. Bethlehem was going through a time of famine and here this little family of four. What's interesting is that the Bible even tells us their names. Four little insignificant people, not kings or princes, just a man and his wife and their two sons struggling to make a living in Bethlehem and now there's famine. The Bible names them Elimelech and Naomi with two sons, Marlon and Kilion. And now they're facing extinction. They're facing the challenging times of famine. It's not the first time that people have, in the big story have found themselves struggling through times of famine. In fact, what moved Jacob to move from Canaan to Egypt was famine. It was the fact that there was no bread in Israel during those years that Joseph, touched by the favour of God, had turned Egypt into the greatest grain producer in the world and all the nations had to come for them to them during that time in order to get their bread. Well, famine was about to play its part again in the big story. And God was going to draw a little foreigner by the name of Ruth into the big story of salvation. And it wasn't the first time that God had seen a cry in the heart of an unknown alien. It was Abraham before he was a well-known person, was just a wandering Aramean, a wandering Syrian, until God called him to leave his household and come to a place he hadn't chosen. It was the little widow in the time of Elijah, God saw the cry in her heart. It was Naaman the Syrian, the general of a foreign army. God saw the cry in his heart. God hears the cry of foreigners and into a foreign land. Now they need to go for refuge from famine. And so off they go with their two sons, Elimelech and Naomi, with their two sons, Marlon and Kilian, into the foreign land of Moab, just trying to, to survive. Survival doesn't feel that noble. Doesn't feel like a great spiritual experience. Just feels really hard. And it didn't get any easier. Over there in Moab, I guess they found work, found a way to make a living. But they hadn't been there too long when Naomi's husband died. Elimelech died and now she was a widow left with two sons. Her two sons found local girls, one called Orpah and one called Ruth. And the two boys married two local girls. And now she was a widow, an elderly widow with two young daughter-in-laws. And as the next decade passes, just trying to survive, those two sons died as well. And now we have a little cluster of widowed women not widowed in a time where there are social service benefits for widows, not widowed at a time when there are TV cameras to poignantly take their pictures and appeal on some worldwide basis for famine relief. Just three little widows trying to survive in what must have felt like an extraordinarily hostile and unhelpful environment. And it's in that moment that uh, Naomi hears that the drought in Bethlehem has broken. They're planting grain again and she makes a decision that her future must lie in returning to her homeland because she has relatives. She even has uh, a plot of land which had been owned by her husband to which she could return, a house to which she could return and try to make the best of it. 
back home as a little widow. And so three little widows head towards Bethlehem. But on the way, she begins to share with them the depth of her feelings of desertion. In many ways, one of the greatest challenges we face when our little lives feel as if they're being overwhelmed in a big world is the issue of perceived alienation from God. We feel as if we're, we're on our own, as if God's lost my address. He doesn't know my phone number anymore. Am I, have I been crossed off God's Christmas list? Because nothing seems to be going right in my life. What did I do wrong? Was it cheating on the grade three exam on, on the origin of Jesus? And was it, was it when I stole money from mummy's purse when I was six years of age? What, what have I done that God seems to not be able to love me anymore. And here you hear her say this, as she stands with her two little daughters-in-law at the crossing from Moab back into Israel, she says, girls, you, you really are going to need, you need to stay because you see the Lord's hand has turned against me. What a sad thing for someone who's an Israelite to say. Someone who, who, who is named with the name of God, who's named with the name of salvation. Sad thing, the Lord's hand has turned against me. Oh no, sweetheart, the Lord's hand has never turned against you. That just feels that way. Oh no, I understand, it feels that way. But no, he, he, no one can separate you from the love of God. And there she pleads with her two uh, daughter-in-laws, Sweetheart, she's saying, it better for you young girls to remain. Better for you to stay here in your own land where you're likely to find husbands who will marry you and care for you and you can build a new future. My, my future has, has flown. The Lord's hand has turned against me. And in that tearful moment of separation, Orpah decides to leave Naomi and return to her family. And now there is one little girl by the name of Ruth, holding on to her mother-in-law's hand. But for this little girl, something has happened to her. She's encountered something. She's seen a woman trusting and fighting for her future in the midst of all kinds of terror and opposition. And she's watched Naomi's faith. Oh, it may seem shaky today. The Lord's hand has turned against me. But she's been watching her, not just for this moment. She's been watching her for a decade. And now this little girl demonstrates that her heart has been bonded to her mother-in-law. And she makes this statement that has become one of the most used statements in wedding ceremonies for ever since she spoke these words. These words were used in my own wedding ceremony 50 years ago. She turns to her mother-in-law and says, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely. If even death separates you and me. You've got to ask yourself, what on earth did that girl see in her mother-in-law to produce that kind of loyalty? And I know that I've often thought about this very issue. What was it that I saw in my mother that was so impacting for me? My mother must have wondered if she'd ever had any impact on me. My mum must have wondered sometimes if all I did was bring a boy into the world to go to jail. <laughs> have my prayers and my... Uh, concern's been a waste of time for Alan. She will never know the bits that I saw that changed my life because I'm not sure I ever told them to her. I remember as a child, um, a, a knock on the door one night and at the, standing at the door was an elderly woman who had a basket full of potpourri. She was another little widow, fallen on hard times. And her way of survival was that she made potpourri and sold them door to door. 
Oh, it would have been so easy for my mother to say, oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. We, we don't need a potpourri here because I was raised on a farm. I know how to do all that myself. But I noticed my mother began to ask her some questions. And the next thing, she'd invited her into the home and she sat her down at the table um, and she began to make this woman a meal. I remember standing in the kitchen as a child, watching this woman eating at the table and realising in my heart we were not responsible for this woman. But my mother was full of compassion. My mother cared about people. My mother loved people. She was a loving woman. I remember some few years later, um, standing alongside my mother at the Q Mental Asylum. It doesn't exist anymore. It was in many ways a frightening place. Um, it was a place of large rooms of people who were, um, were mentally uh, distressed. And we were in a room of maybe 400 mental patients while my mother at the piano led a small choir from our church in singing hymns and singing songs of worship and of comfort over those people while they wailed and moaned in their mental anguish. I remember standing beside my mother and, and seeing the calmness with which she played and worshipped, and she may never know this, how that moment touched my heart. You see, the prisoners are listening. The prisoners are listening, Mum. Her patient, gracious, thoughtful life of good marked my life. I wonder if that's what Ruth saw in Naomi and had bonded her heart to a God she had never seen, but she knew it existed in Naomi's heart. I remember watching my mother over the years. My mother was raised in a German kind of environment because we were Lutherans and my grandparents still spoke German up on the farm. It was only the law that forbade the Lutherans to educate their children in German during the First World War. And my mother was raised in that environment. She was raised in, in a much kind of more staid church than the one you belong to, much more formal than, than this church. But you see, my mum wasn't just a formal Christian. She was a lover of God. I remember at the age of 52, my mother got baptised in the Holy Spirit and God gave her the gift of speaking in tongues and it just totally transformed her prayer life. The very week that my mother was baptised in the Holy Spirit, that same week, my two brothers packed their bags in anger at my father, got on their motorbikes at the age of 15 and 16 and rode off into a life of drugs and crime for the next years that broke my parents' heart. But you see, my mother had been baptised in the Spirit. All it did was energise her prayer life. And she had no idea over the next five years where those boys all were. But she told me this story sometime later. It marked my heart. She said she woke one night and she had a vision of my youngest brother lying on the ground with chains over him. And she slipped out of bed on her knees and with that prayer language that God had given her, she interceded for my brother right through the night. She had no idea that on that very night, my brother was lying in a rehabilitation centre, a government rehabilitation centre, having been arrested a few days earlier in the possession of a large quantity of drugs. And when he asked the policeman what he could do to help himself, he said, if you put yourself in rehab, it'll go better for you when you come to court. And for four nights, he had lain in that rehabilitation centre. That night, my mother had that dream, slipped out of bed and interceded for him through the night. He said, as I lay in that rehab centre that night, a thought occurred to me that if God was real, maybe this could change. He checked himself out of that centre and in the middle of the night hitchhiked across Melbourne. An old friend from school just happened to pick him up and drove him all the way to my sister's house. He was knocking on her door at four o'clock in the morning. She opened the door and he fell in on the carpet, lay there crying on the carpet. And the next day she took him to see an old friend of mine, Pastor Terry Boyle at Christian Life Centre. And Pastor Terry Boyle led my brother to Jesus. Today he leads Teen Challenge in this state of Victoria. 
because my mother knew how to pray. Oh, she might have been a Lutheran by background, but she'd been baptised in the Spirit and my mother knew how to pray. I took my father's funeral in 1989 and I was standing beside my mother at the grave doing the final bits and as she stood at his graveside, my father's graveside, I heard her say to him over the grave, good night, sweetheart, I'll see you in the morning. They must have said that to each other. Night after night throughout their marriage, I stood beside my mother and I watched her faith carry her, carry her through that tragic moment of realising that now she would complete her life's journey alone. It marked my heart. That's what happened to Ruth. Ruth encountered a mother. Although she felt wounded and beat up by life, she was really a woman of faith. She was a good woman. And because of that, Ruth was now drawn to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God, through that relationship, ushered her into the favour of God. Mums, you have no idea the impact that you will finally one day see as all of the big story unfolds in the lives of those whom you have trusted, those whom you've helped and who God has given you the, the ability to touch. But listen to the struggle. Listen to the struggle. Home she goes. Naomi goes home to Bethlehem. And the community are astounded. Years down the track, we never knew where you were. Naomi has returned. She's come home to Bethlehem. Listen to her broken heart. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Oh, no, sweetheart. No, God didn't do that to you. You're living in a war zone. God did not plan hurt and disaster for you. You've been living in a war zone and you have felt the pain of loss. But sweetheart, nothing can separate you from His love. And by the way, sweetheart, God isn't even offended. He's heard His kids complain every day since He created them. And He loves them every single day through their complaints and their little hurts. He is for you. Naomi, you are a champion of faith. And by the way, you may not see it yet, but the seeds of everlasting favour. You think God is punishing you? Standing right beside you, you have no idea of the favour that has, you've brought home from Moab because standing right beside you, you don't even know this yet, but the great grandmother of Jesus Christ himself is standing right alongside you. And the only reason she is in Bethlehem to become the great grandmother of Jesus is because you in your faith have brought her home. Well done, sweetheart. Well done. Don't be discouraged. Oh, the, the story is wonderful. Um, home she came. This little girl could have gone looking for a husband but she was so committed to her mother-in-law that all she does is serve her. She, she yields her life to being a support to her mother-in-law. And by the grace of God, you read the book and there is a kinsman redeemer. His name is Boaz. He buys Elimelech's ground and in the process receives Naomi into his care and Ruth as his wife. Just as he acts out his role as kinsman Redeemer. And the little girl who said, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Oh, by the grace of God, sweetheart, you've brought sweetness to the entire world. We'll call you pleasant because you've played your role in the big story of life. You brought Ruth home to Bethlehem and through him, through her, married to Boaz, they will bring a child into the world. His name will be called Obed. And Obed will give rise to a man called Jesse. 
And Jesse will give rise to a man called David, a man after God's own heart, the very one who will be called Jesus of Nazareth will be called the, 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 the child, not the child, the, I lost the word. Do you ever lost a word, Pastor? I lost a word. Thank you very much. Um, he, he, uh, the, now I've lost it completely. <laughs> come on, pastors, help me out. Give me, uh, say again. Yes, come on, you help me. You're, you're, this is your big chance, mum, help me out. Yes, I know, we're, we're nearly getting it right. Then <laughs> amazing, something can just slip straight out of your mind. He will be called the son of David as one of his great marks, Jesus, the son of David. And where did David come from? He came from that little Moabite girl brought home to Bethlehem by a faithful mum by the name of Naomi. Let me say something to you mothers today. Although she said, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter, God had never abandoned her. And through her faithfulness, he turned her life into part of the biggest story the world will ever know. And I can guarantee you something, even though on the day she spoke those words, she felt disappointed. Naomi is not disappointed today. Naomi is not disappointed with the outcome of her suffering and her faithful life. And every mother is found in these two mothers. Every mother at some time feels as if her life is just a small story. But you need to know something through your faithfulness. You are playing your part in the biggest story ever. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, Jesus said. I have overcome the world. My mother thought I would end up in jail. I didn't. I'm here, mum. I'm still walking. I'm still walking in the straight and narrow, mum. And I'm walking in the straight and narrow because, Mum, you marked my life. And I am here because of you. Ladies, be bold and very courageous. Be the godly woman that you are because God is watching over you. He watches over your tears and your troubles. He watches over your washing. He watches over your spaghetti bolognese. He washes over your ironing. He watches over you as you earn and do whatever you do to create a workable household. And one day when the big story is finally told, you won't be disappointed either. Father, I pray over my friends today. I pray over every woman in this house especially for the ones who sometimes feel like their life is just very small. I give you thanks for the ministry that they exercise. I give you thanks for the life that flows through them and in them. I thank you for the glory of the Lord that is being ministered through their faithfulness. And there will be a day when they will see and be amazed they have touched lives and brought them into the big story. In Jesus' Name today, I pray over them. If you came to church today and you'd be honest enough to say, God, sometimes I feel like my life is such a small story. I want you to be honest and lift your hand and say to God, Lord, I understand how Naomi feels because sometimes that's how I feel. I want you to lift your hand because I'm going to pray over you. Father, you see these hands. You see these hands. You see the name. You know the place where they put their head down at night. You see the prayers. You see the stains on the pillow from their tears. I thank you for my mother who slipped out of bed one night and on her knees changed my brother's life. I thank you for their faithfulness. I pray today the spirit of encouragement would touch them and you would say to them, fear not, sweetheart, There'll come a day when you'll be amazed at what I've done through you. You came to church this morning and I don't know what brought you through the, day, through the door, but here's the reality. You need to be part of that big story. Oh, you're only a single life, but Jesus Christ stretched out His hands on a cross and died that you might be totally forgiven 
and drawn into His big story and become part of a new heaven and a new earth in which dwells nothing but forgiveness and righteousness and peace. But there comes a moment where you have to ask. You need to be willing to say to God, I need your help. I want to be part of the big story. I want to yield my life to your greatness. You may have done it once in the past and you let it get away from you. And today would be a wonderful day to start again. I want you all to bow your heads for one moment. If you've come to church today and somehow in your heart there's a softness, you say, God, could I be part of your big story? Is that possible? You need to ask. You need to say, Lord, come into my life. If that's you today, I want you to lift your hand. I want to pray over you right where you are. I want to pray for you. I want to pray right where you're sitting and say, God, come into their life. Change everything. Is that you? Just lift your hand. Let me pray for you. Let me ask God for your future. Good God. I'm so glad. We'll pray in just a moment. Where else are you? Come on. Where's another? Show me your hand. Let me pray with you today. I want you to take your hand and put it right here. Put your hand on your heart. And I'll teach you how to pray. Very simple. Just ask. Say these words. Heavenly Father, I need help. I've made so many mistakes. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Come into my life. Jesus, You died for me. I'll follow You all the days of my life. 